Hello and welcome to SQL Server 2016 New Features. My name is David Postlethwaite. I'm a database administrator for a large financial services company on the south coast of England. I've been working as a DBA for the last seven years and I currently manage both SQL and Oracle instances. Previous to that, I was a developer using .NET, SQL, Access, FoxPro, Oracle, and way back in time, I was a Windows and Netware administrator. You can contact me using the addresses shown on the screen, and I'm also an occasional contributor to the blog on getinellis.com. I'm going to split this presentation into two parts. Firstly, I'll go through all the interesting changes that I found in SQL Server 2016, and then I'll go back and demonstrate some of these for you. Microsoft are making some bold statements about SQL Server 2016. I've read a few reviews, and the general opinion is that SQL 2016 is very good, very stable, and worth looking at. It's been thoroughly tested by many companies during the beta release cycles, and many of the new features have been incorporated into Azure SQL Database, so they were being used and improved a long time before SQL 2016 was released. So if you normally wait until Service Pack 1 before deploying new versions into your company, this isn't really necessary with SQL 2016. Interestingly, Microsoft has said that from now on, cumulative updates are tested and being treated just like service packs. Microsoft now recommends ongoing proactive installation of cumulative updates as they become available and not to wait for a service pack. We may find that the term service pack may soon cease to exist. SQL Server 2016 is version 13, and it comes with the normal set of additions. There are Enterprise, Standard, Express, Express with advanced services, in other words, with reporting services, and developer additions. You may see a web edition listed on some Microsoft web pages, but not everywhere, so I'm not quite sure how that fits in. Developer Edition is now free to download from the Visual Studio Dev Essentials website without the need for an MSDN subscription. This, the link on the screen will take you to where you can download it. Management Studio supports SQL 2008 to 2016 plus Azure SQL Database. It will work with SQL 2000 and 2005, but Microsoft don't guarantee it will work perfectly. And I'm sure you have all heard that Microsoft are working on a version of SQL Server for Linux, but there are a few details available as to how it will work. But Microsoft say it should be available by the middle of 2017. Before we look at what's new, let's just take a quick look at what is being removed. Discontinued, there are only two things of note. SQL Server is now 64-bit only. There is no 32-bit version, though Management Studio can still be installed on a 32-bit server. Compatibility level 90, i.e. 2005, has been removed from SQL 2016. Deprecated, i.e. features due to be dropped in the next release or in future releases. There's a few here for you. Data types, you should now be trying to avoid using text, end text, and image. A lot of the SP underscore store procedures, such as SP attach DB, SP add user, will be dropped. You should now be using the more ANSI compliant commands, such as create database and create user. Mirroring will disappear in a future release. You should now be using always on availability groups if you want to have mirroring type functions. Backup to tape will be dropped. I can't imagine that affects too many people. And all the store procedures, functions, catalog views, etc., that are used by SQL Trace and Profiler will be disappearing. You should now be using extended events for performance tuning. And finally, get into the habit of putting a semicolon at the end of your commands. This will become compulsory in a future release. For those of you who use Oracle, you will know that you have to end your commands with a semicolon. 
otherwise they don't work and this will become standard in SQL in a future release. There's links below which give a full list of all the discontinued and deprecated features. The installation process has changed and there are a few things worth noting. SQL Server Management Studio has been taken out of the server installation is now a separate web download. As a result, Management Studio will have a different upgrade schedule to the server. It now checks for updates each time it is loaded, just like most other desktop software. And there's a link at the bottom of the screen where you can download the latest Management Studio. You can now enable perform volume maintenance tasks during the installation rather than having to edit the local security policy afterwards. In case you aren't aware of what instant file initialization is, normally when data and log files are created or extended, the operating system will put zeros into every sector of the new part of the file so, any, so that any data left on the disk from previous deleted files is overwritten. This can take quite a long time and can cause the database to appear to hang, which is why some companies don't allow autogrowth of data files. Instant file initialization doesn't fill the space with zeros, but just leaves it as it found it. So extending the database file is much, much faster. The old disk content is only overwritten as new data is written to the files. There is a security drawback to this in that potentially the old disk content could be recovered from the empty unwritten space in the data file, but that's pretty unlikely. It's been a recommendation for some time to enable perform, and perform volume maintenance tasks for instant file initialization for the SQL Server Surface account, so this is quite a useful addition. Another recommendation has been to to set lock pages in memory permission for the SQL Service account, and it would have been nice if Microsoft had added that to this screen as well. More information from the link at the bottom of the screen. There's been improvements to data folders. You can now specify different folders for your user database and logs from your system database, which can be very handy if you store your system databases in different location. We can now configure multiple tempdb files during installation. As I'm sure you all are aware, it's been best practice for a while to have more than one tempdb data file if you're running on a multi-core machine, and this will save you having to add them manually after you've installed SQL Server. But there are limitations through the GUI. You can only specify a maximum of eight files, and a maximum size of one gig. If you try and put more than that, the GUI just resets them to that maximum. Also, the model database, the default growth for new user databases has been set to more realistic values. New default data and log file size is now eight meg, still not very much, and the default growth is 64 meg, which is a bit better than what it has been for many, many years. Trace flag 118 and 117 are now enabled by default in SQL Server 2016. Enabling these two trace flags has been a recommendation for quite a while to improve tempdb performance. So this is a welcome change. Trace flag 118 resolves contention in tempdb by forcing new objects to be allocated to full extents instead of mixed extents where multiple objects could contend for the same page. And trace flag 117 tries to stop uneven file growth. If you have multiple tempdb data files, they'll be used in a round robin fashion only if they are the same size. If one file grows larger than the others, SQL Server will tend to just use the larger file for most operations largely nullifying the goal of spreading I.O. across multiple files in the first place. Trace flag 117 forces all of a database's data files to grow when any individual file needs to grow. So as long as you create the files the same size and set autogrowth the same, you will ensure that I.O. is spread 
amongst all the files. The catch, this also applies to user databases as well, which may not be what you are after. Now, Microsoft has introduced a number of new features to help with security with SQL Server. And the first of these is dynamic data masking. The dynamic data masking, you can obscure confidential columns of data in a table so that users who are not authorized cannot see the data. It doesn't change the data in the table, just places a mask over it when it's displayed on the screen. By default, DB owner can always see unmasked data. Everyone else will see the masked data. You can control which other users and roles can see masked data by using the grant unmask function. Dynamic data masking can be very useful when copying production database to test or production support. You can define your masks in your production database, but only activate them in the UAT database, potentially saving many hours running obfuscation code. Currently, dynamic data masking has four predefined functions for masking. We have the default function, which replaces all characters with X and all numbers with zero. We have an email function, which replaces a the part before the at symbol with the first letter and X's and puts at xxxx.com at the end. And a partial function, probably the most useful. Here you can define the number of characters to display at the beginning and the number of characters to display at the end and the masking function in the middle. There's also a random function which just produces a random number. With row level security, the SQL database engine can restrict access to certain rows based on a SQL Server login. So for instance, you might allow sales staff to only see customers in their territory. Rows are restricted by a filter predicate function that determines if a row can be seen or not by that person. And then a security policy is used to ensure the filter predicate is executed for every single DML operation, whether that's a select, an update, an insert, or a de delete. And this ensures that the sales staff, in our example, can only view and update their own customers. Implementing row-level security at the database layer means developers no longer need to write complex code in their application. And best of all, it works outside the application, such as browsing using Management Studio and users will not even know they are restricted by row level security. They will just get the rows back that they are allowed to see. Always Encrypted is another new feature in SQL 2016, and it's also available in Azure SQL Database. Here, you can encrypt columns in a table with a master key and a certificate so that they will appear as encrypted strings to those who don't have the required certificate installed on their PC. Once the certificate is installed on a computer, the unencrypted data can be seen. This will go some way to resolving the concern of people worried about putting their sensitive data on a shared server in the cloud, such as Azure. The calling application, including Management Studio, must have an extra parameter in the connection string, which is column encryption setting equals enabled. Always Encrypted is currently only supported in ADO.NET 4.6. And in the last couple of weeks, ODBC 13.1 has now become available to support Always Encrypted. But you can expect other drivers such as JDBC to become supportable in the future. To edit the data, you must create a parameterized query. You cannot update it using a normal update query. It just doesn't work. Additionally, you can't update from Management Studio. It gives you an error. It must be from an ADO application such as PowerShell or .NET or the new ODBC 13.1 driver. It's quite tricky to set up using T-SQL, but Microsoft have written a nice 
wizard for you. You just need to right click on the table and select always encrypted and work through the wizard. Temporal tables, also known as system version tables, allow SQL Server to keep a history of your data in a separate table. With temporal tables, every time a row in the base table is updated, SQL Server automatically moves the original row to the temporal table. The most obvious use for this is auditing. You can query the temporal table and see the state of the data in a particular time in the past, or see how the J. The most obvious use for this is in auditing. You can query the temporal table and see the state of the data at a particular time in the past, or see how the data has changed over time. The temporal table is physically a different table than the base table, but is linked to the base table and they must stay together. So if you use triggers to track changes to tables, you could make your life much easier. There are a few rules. The base table must have a primary key and it requires two extra columns to record the start and end date of the existence of that particular set of data in that row. But those two columns can be hidden so that people don't try and accidentally update them. There are also some limitations. Um, the tables can't be file tables. They can't be in memory tables. And the insert and update can't update the two special time, date time columns. Data in the temporary te temporal, data in the temporal table cannot be modified and there are limitations on triggers within the tables as well. Microsoft have been pushing a stretch database for quite a while and many bloggers consider it to be a really wonderful new feature. Stretch database allows you to stretch or split an on-premises table into an Azure SQL database so that your most frequently accessed data is stored on-premises while your less accessed, maybe historical data is held off-site in an Azure SQL database. The idea being that you can take advantage of cheap cloud storage to hold your less frequently accessed data. When you enable a table to stretch, the older data moves over to the Azure SQL database behind the scenes. When you need to run a query that accesses active and historical information in a stretch table, the database engine seamlessly queries both the on-premises database as well as Azure SQL database and returns the results to you as if they came from a single source. You define the predicate function that determines what is old and what is current, follow the wizard and you can configure it and it will then start working for you. There are numerous restrictions, there are no computed columns, you cannot have defaults, you cannot have check constraints. The table can't be referenced by a foreign key, i.e. you can stretch your order detail table, but you can't stretch your orders table. You can't update or delete the archived data. Once it's archived, it is there forever. The filter predicate does have limitations and it must be written to be fast enough not to cause performance issues. Now, Microsoft claim you can make use of cheap cloud storage, but the cheapest option currently for a stretch database is 700 euros a month, which to me doesn't sound very cheap. Up to now, you've only been able to see execution plans that are actively in the plan cache, and you can't see any history for these plans once they have been removed from the plan cache. With Query Store, SQL Server can now save historical execution plans. Not only that, but it also saves the query statistics that go along with those historical plans, and this allows you to track a query's execution plan performance over time. So if you have a query that suddenly starts to perform badly, what Microsoft call regressed, you can see what has happened to the execution plan and even force the query to use a previous execution plan that gives better performance than the one it's using at the moment. So you could use the query store to find the number of times the query was executed during a given time window, identify the top expensive queries, based on execution time or memory, 
um, or, or CPU. You can audit the history of query plans for a given query, analyze the resources, IO, CPU, et cetera, use uses patterns for a particular database. You can simply enable it for a database and SQL will start collecting the information for you. You can then view the query store using the built-in reports or with the new T-SQL procedures and functions. This is quite cool. You can now watch your query plans perform in real time. There's a new button next to view execution plan in Management Studio 2016. Click on that and you can then watch your query plans running. And this may help you to work out where the bottlenecks are in your queries. Though I do hope that most of your queries run so quickly that you won't actually see anything in the time available. And this will work against SQL Server 2014 Service Pack 1 databases as well. I did read on one blog that um, people were a bit worried that developers might start writing queries slower so that they could actually sit there and watch them. But I hope that doesn't come to fruition. But it could be a useful way of finding out where your bottlenecks are in your queries or as a teaching aid. Probably more useful is this option to be able to compare execution plans. So once you've displayed an execution plan, you can save it to disk. And then when you have another execution plan, you can then load up the one you have saved to disk and display them together to see the difference. There have been a number of improvements to T-SQL. This is probably the most useful of them, which is drop if exists. Up to now, we've had to write complicated queries to find out whether a table exists, as shown on the screen. Now we can simply say drop table if exists and the name of the table. And this applies to numerous objects now in, C in SQL Server. And this should help to make our code look a lot cleaner. If, anything, if you're anything like me, I can never remember what the exact a query needs to be to look for a table or a procedure. Just being able to say drop if exists will make life much easier. What is missing still is a create or replace function to complement this. And I believe there is a petition now being raised for Microsoft to introduce this. And this will then bring us in line with Oracle, which already has a create or replace function for store procedures which makes life a lot easier when coding. If you use partition tables, there is now a truncate table with partition function. And this should greatly simplify maintenance of large partitioned tables. Up to now, you've probably had to write complicated delete statements to delete from a particular partition. Now you can simply say with partitions and then list them out in numerous different formats. So that should help you quite a lot if you're with if you use partition tables. I'm sure many of you who have large databases and large tables have hit problems trying to get exclusive access to make DDL changes. With SQL Server 2016 Enterprise, you can now use the online equals on option and SQL Server will try and make your DDL changes while the table is in use. This is enterprise only because it uses some of the code around online indexing, which is for enterprise only. But for those of you with large tables, this could be a godsend. There have been some improvements to CheckDB to make it run faster. CheckScanner now uses a lock-free design similar to those used in, in memory tables, allowing DBCC to scale much better than previous versions. Fewer locks means it can run faster. The extended logical checks, which was the bit that often caused it to take a long time to run, has now been removed from the default and is only run as a, a separate option. And you can now specify max DOP, so you can specify how many CPUs you want to use, which again should help to improve performance. SQL Server 2016 has added a function for compression and decompression using the standard gzip algorithm. 
So you could compress data and then store it as binary data in your table, reducing the size of the table. You could hold variables as compressed values, then uncompress them when you use them to save memory. Or you could read data from your table, compress it, and send the compressed data to your application, which could then decompress it at the client end because it's only using standard gzip compression and so improve network performance but you would need to obviously evaluate whether the, the improvement in network traffic is lost in the time it takes to decompress and compress your data the amount of compression obviously would be dependent on the type of data. If you have XML or JSON data, then it might compress more as there's a lot of white space normally in those types of data. Format message. If you use format message in earlier versions, format message could only use strings located in sysdoc messages. You can now apply your own user strings if you need to. There have been some major improvements to column store indexes in SQL 2016. Column store index was introduced in SQL Server 2012, and it stores data in columns rather than rows, which can increase query performance for large amounts of data, such as data warehouses. In SQL 2012, it only supported a few data types, and the index was not updatable. Once it was created, the table became read-only. 2014 introduced clustered column store index and they became read write in 2016 you can now have additional secondary indexes that is good old fashioned b tree style indexes just like a traditional table and you can now create primary keys and foreign keys using b tree indexes with sql 2016 i would have to say that uh, column store has now matured to become a really useful tool if you're involved in database warehousing, you should be look, having a close look at. There have been improvements to in-memory tables as well. The in-memory the in-memory OLTP engine, originally called Hackathon, was introduced in SQL 2014, and this allows you to build tables that exist solely in memory, making them much faster than traditional disk-based tables. Memory optimized tables use row versioning to manage updates. And this is known as non-blocking multi-version optimistic concurrency control and eliminates both locks and latches, thereby achieving significant performance advantages. Store procedures that are only used in in-memory tables can be compiled to give even better performance. SQL 2016 has improved in-memory tables the maximum size has gone from 250 meg to 2 gig. You can now include file stream data. Trans you can now use transparent data encryption, foreign keys, and check constraints. Microsoft claim you can get up to 100 times better performance than traditional tables, but it does require a lot of memory as the whole table must exist in memory. But it's definitely worth looking at if you have the need for very fast tables. Finally, there are three new languages available in SQL 2016, and I must confess I have little knowledge of these, so I'm only going to mention them for completeness. With Polybase, you can now write queries to join SQL Server data with semi-structured data stored in Hadoop or SQL Blob Storage. R is a statistical language used by the majority of data scientists and statisticians. With Microsoft purchase of Revolution Analytics, the authors of R, they are now able to incorporate R code inside SQL Server. Currently, users have had to export their SQL Server data into an R engine to be processed and then imported back afterwards. This new feature allows data to be analyzed using R code directly inside the SQL Server engine. Microsoft have added some new functions to provide support for querying JSON data stored in SQL Server. Right, time for a demo. So this is SQL Server 2016 Management Studio. You're not going to really notice much difference between previous versions. Uh, the icons seem to have changed very, very slightly. So let's have a look at some of the new features. 
Let's start off with dynamic data masking. This is where we can place a obfuscation mask over the top of a table. I'm going to use my AdventureWorks 2016 CTP3 database as an example. So let's use that. I'm going to drop the table if it exists. I'm going to create a table called customers and I'm just going to insert some values into that table. And if we view the data, just so you can see what it looks like, we have a first name, a last name, a social insurance number, credit card, email address, phone number. Stand detail out of AdventureWorks. So I'm going to alter my table now. I'm going to add a masking function to the email address using the email function. I'm going to use the default function on the phone number. I am going to use um, a partial function on the last name and also the partial function on the credit card. So if we run that, that is now completed. We could have done this straight off using the create table function if you want to build one from scratch. So let's have a look at our data. And because I'm a database owner, that masking function does not have any effect on me. So let's create a user and give him read-only access to my table. And now if I run as that masked user, you'll see I get the master data back. So the last name, I'm seeing the first and the last two letters. The credit card number, I'm just seeing XXXX, except for the last four digits. Email address, I'm seeing the first letter and then at xxx.com. And the phone number, I use the default function, so it's just displaying all X's. Now, as I said, the data in the table hasn't changed. All we're doing is putting a mask over the top of it. So clever users could try and work out what the underlying data is. So in this case, we're going to execute as masked user, and we're going to use the where clause last name equals Bryant. And if I run that, you'll find we get a row returned because it's using the underlying data. So we could, if we were clever and we had the ability work out what the rows are. And that is a drawback that you must be aware of if you decide to use dynamic data masking. Now, if we want to give a user the ability to see the unmasked data, then we can use the grant unmask function. So if I do that to the mask user function, we now can see all of the unmasked data. And it is a case of all or nothing. You can't choose at the moment which columns you would like to be masked for a particular group of users. So let's revoke that back again. And we're now seeing the master data again. Now you might think, let's just write all the data out to a temp table and we'll get around it. But if I execute as a masked user and write some, the data to a temporary table and then view that temporary table, we still see the masked data. In fact, it's written that the masked data to the table. So my where clause that we used earlier on doesn't return anything because now we are seeing the masked data. We can drop a masked function. So if I drop the one on email address and then I run as masked user, we'll now see that the email address is clear. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how um, dynamic data masking can work. The next one we want to look at is row level security. So let me just drop any policies and functions if they already exist. With row level security, this allows us to limit the rows that a certain people can see. So I'm going to create, first of all, a security function. Uh, Microsoft do suggest, recommend that you put these type of functions into a schema called security. And this is going to return a true or false based on the salesperson's territory ID as to whether they're allowed to see a row or if they're a sales manager or a database owner, then they would be allowed to see a row as well. 
So let's create that. And then we're going to create a security policy, which is going to add the filter predicate, that table function I've just created, to the customer table called P2. So let me run that in. So as database owner, if I look at this table, I can see all the rows, whether regardless of the territory ID. So I can see 1, 8, 6, 9, 4, 10. We're seeing all the different territory IDs. So if I now execute as Michael 9, which is a user that already exists, and he's only and his sales area is territory 2. So if I execute as Michael 9, we now only see the rows that are from territory 2. If he tries to delete from a different territory, i.e. territory 10, I get zero rows back. I don't get an error message. It just says you haven't rowed, made any changes. If I try and update a row in a different territory, i.e. 9, again, I get no rows back. I can't insert a row into territory 10. It tells me this time I do get an error message saying I'm not allowed to do it, but I can insert a row into territory 2, which is my territory, and that works fine. And I can't try and steal someone else's customers from territory 7 to territory 2. That also brings back zero rows. So this could save having to write lots of complex code within the application. You can now do it within the database, and this could make things a lot easier for you. Always Encrypted is the next one. And this allows us to encrypt columns using a master key and a certificate. So let me just in drop my encrypted table if it exists. I'm using my new if exists command here. And in my encrypted database, I'm going to create a table and I'm going to insert some rows, which you're all very familiar with. And here they are. You've seen them all before. So if I now come down here to databases, encrypted DB, find my table, right click, I have an option called encrypt columns. So if we click on Encrypt Columns, we can now choose the columns we wish to encrypt. So I'm going to encrypt the social insurance number and the credit card number. We've got a choice of types of encryption. We can have deterministic or we can have randomized. So deterministic will always return the same encrypted value each time. Randomized will produce a different encrypted value each time you select. Randomized is obviously more secure, but if you need to join tables or you need to use where clauses or you need the same value returned each time, then deterministic is the one to use. So I'm going to stick with deterministic on this case. So let's move on. This is now going to generate a master key for us, and I'm going to store it in my personal certificate store. You can put it into an Azure key vault and get your application to read it from there. Um, I haven't tried that personally, but it is there to try. We now have a choice. We can either proceed to finish now, or we can generate a PowerShell script to run later. Because obviously encrypting data can take quite a long time. In fact, I'm going to click this off. And you don't want anyone using the database as it's being encrypted, because you're going to end up corrupting data if someone tries to update a row as it's being encrypted, you're going to end up with a bit of a mess. Now, this is only eight rows of very simple data, but it does still take quite a while to encrypt. And there we are. In this case, a couple of minutes. Um, but it is something to think about. If you are going to encrypt a huge table, it could take a long time to apply all that encryption. So now we've encrypted. If I try and select those rows, I get back encrypted data. Even though I'm a SA, a DBO, DB owner, I can still only see, I still see encrypted values. If I try and insert a row into my encrypted database, 
I get a long-winded error message saying that my varchar doesn't work with encryption. So what I need to do is I need to reconnect to my query and add into the options under additional parameters here, connection column encryption setting equals enabled. And if I reconnect, reuse the encrypted database, and now it's select from customers, I can now see the unencrypted data. But even though I'm now seeing the unencrypted data, if I try and insert a row into my table, I still get the same error message saying that my varchar is incompatible with the encrypted type. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a parameterized store procedure, and here it is. So it's very simple, create procedure, pass in the values, insert, nothing unusual about that. Nothing that anyone shouldn't be able to write. If I try running that parameterized stored procedure from within Management Studio, so here I'm declaring all my values, executing my store procedure. It still will not work for me. It still comes back and goes, Bleh, you can't do this doesn't seem to allow you to be able to insert data from Management Studio. So let me create a user called Encrypt User. Give that user DB owner, just to be on the safe side. If we flip over now to PowerShell, I have some PowerShell queries that I've written. If you don't know PowerShell, then it is definitely something worth looking at for managing SQL databases. So this is our, our uh, ADO.NET 4.6 application. So here's my connection string. I'm going to connect to my server using this user called EncryptDB. And I've added my column encryption setting equals enabled function. And I'm just going to say select star from customers and execute as a reader. So if I run that, I get some data back. So here's the next one. I'm now going to try and insert data. And here we, this is a bit longer. So again, I've got my connection string. I'm going to run a store procedure. And I'm going to run a store procedure called add customer, which I created earlier. And here are the parameters I'm going to pass in. So customer ID, first name, last name. And this is a bit of a weird thing, which I still don't quite understand. So when I add in my social insurance number, my SIN, and I'm going to pass in this value, I have needed to specify the database type, the size, and the direction, rather than just saying add with value. If I don't specify all these parameters, extra parameters for my parameter, then I will get an error message. But the weird thing is, credit card number is also an encrypted column, and it doesn't seem to mind whether I specify it's a var char with a size 25, and the value and whether what direction it's going in. And I don't know why one needs it and one doesn't, if there's something strange which I don't I haven't quite grasped yet. So if I run this procedure, so let's start from there, run my parameterized stored query. I now get one row inserted. So that is how to do it. Now, Microsoft likes to say that uh, always encrypted, all you need to do is encrypt your data, add that extra parameter into your connection string, and you're away. But I'm not so convinced by that because I think you need to make sure you would need to ensure that all your all your update and insert and delete queries in your application are done via parameterized queries, and you may need to check as to whether the uh, row you're updating requires all these extra values supplied for the parameter, otherwise it doesn't work. But I think this is a major step forward is in ensuring that your data stays safe, especially in an Azure shared, a shared database on Azure. 
So that's always encrypted. The next one we want to look at is temporal tables. So a temporal table is a table where we can hold rows, historical rows of data. So let me drop my table and my history table if it already exists. I'm going to create a table called test table and test temporal. And you'll see that I'm adding two extra columns here, one called um, start time and one called end time. And these are compulsory in a temporal table because it needs to know when this particular row or unique set of values in this row was first created and when it was last, when it was changed. And that is what gets written into the temporary table. And then we just add this system versioning equals on history table and the name of the history table. If you don't specify a history table, SQL will make one up for you. Let's load some values into our table. And let's just have a look at our temporal table. Here we are, we only have three rows, Fred, John and David with various salaries. And you can see that the start time has been written in but they don't have an end time because they don't they've never been changed up to now so if I delete a row so I'm going to delete for ID 2 and then I'm going to so let's run that and then I'm going to update and change ID 3 to have a salary of a hundred thousand which would be very nice if I now look at my original table you'll see I have two rows in there with a start time, no end time, because obviously it still exists. That will always be blank. But if I now look at my history table, you'll see that I have two rows in there with the start time and the time that they ceased to exist. So we can now build up a history as each row changes exactly what that row looked like during that time. So I can say that David had a salary of 50,000 from that time to that time. And as we added more rows in, then obviously that would go up. That would increase and we could then use that to work out my history over the, my salary history over the last 10 years or whenever. So temporal table, I think, could save a lot of trouble um, where we've used update and insert triggers before to try and capture changes I think this could make quite a big difference. So the next one to look at is live query stats. This is a little fun thing which Microsoft have put in. We will see we now have an extra icon here called include live query stats. So if I click on that, now run my reasonably long query. Give SQL a while to sort itself out. And we can now go to live query stats. Here we go. And we can now actually watch it running in real time. And we can see here that the sort is what's taking all the time, the delay. So the index scan has run. The sort is now sorting it. And this scan is running as well. And so it can give you some idea of what is going on inside your query plan. Maybe more of a gimmick, but, or as a teacher, Aid. If you have very fast queries, obviously it's not going to help because they will they will disappear before you have a chance to, before has a chance to see it. But it could be quite useful. So let's take a look at a query store. This is where we can start storing historical information about our query plans. To enable query store, <clears throat> just right click on the database you wish to collect data on, click on properties, and at the bottom we have an option called query store. And here we can turn it on, make it read write so that it will collect data. Or if you've got the data you want, you can then freeze it with read only so it doesn't get lost. We can determine the interval, um, the flush interval, the collection, how big we want the query store to be, and um, what we want to capture, and various other useful settings. So let me click OK on that. 
I'm just going to clear down the query store to ensure that it is empty of any data so we can see what we are looking for in this example. I'm now going to clear out the procedure cache. And this will ensure that this procedure will get a new execution plan rather than using one that may already be lurking around. So this is a fairly straightforward query. We're just going to query the product table, the transaction history table, and we have a parameterized query. So we're just going to pass in name like K%. Percent. And I must remember to turn on include execution plan. And we're also going to turn on include client statistics as well. So if I run this query, it will create a new execution plan. And this runs really, really quickly. Here's the execution plan using index seeks and nested loop joins. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that execution plan to disk so we can compare it later. If I run another execution query, slightly different parameter this time, I'm going to use P instead of K. This will naturally use the same execution plan, which is what we expect. So let's clear down the procedure cache. And this will now force SQL to create a new execution plan for us based on this particular query. So here's a slightly different query. Now I'm using a range H2R for my parameter. If I run that query this time, it takes a lot longer to run because the query optimizer is obviously working out a different query plan based on my parameters. And if we look here, we now have a completely different execution plan. What I can do is if I right click, I can compare that to my previous execution plan. And you will see this is the original one. This is the new one, much different. And there are various properties that you can use to compare as well. But what we're interested in here is that they are actually different. So let me just shut down some of these things, get back to a big screen. All right, so if I now rerun my original query, where we just had name like K, it will now use my new execution plan, which isn't giving the same query performance as the old one. Similarly, if I run my query plan against the second query, if I run the second query, we will get back again the second query plan, which isn't giving us such good performance. So there are a number of um, views and procedures that we can use to pull back data on our, from our query store. And this one will show me all the queries that have more than one execution plan. If I click that, you'll see query ID 2 has two different execution plans, plan ID 2 and plan ID 3. So we instantly know this has had two different query plans over the time that I'm looking. Again, I have another query here that will return regressed queries, i.e. ones that are running slower. And it is showing here query ID 2 as one to have a look at. So if I open up AdventureWorks, we now have this new option called Query Store in our menu and several reports. Now the regress reports should show me my reports that are getting slower, but it doesn't for my one query. I'm not quite sure why. I assume it's because the actual time between good and bad is so minuscule that it doesn't see any difference. I'm not sure, but I can't see it. But I can use this tracked query option to demonstrate what we're after. So I can track query number two, which is the one we were looking at. And here we have it. So we can see that about 11.30, I ran a query number one. And that used that execution plan and took a nice short time. And 
I also have this query up here. And that used that execution plan and it took a lot longer. What I would like, without having to clear down the query cache or anything like that, procedure cache, is can I ask a SQL to use this query plan? I can. I can simply say force plan and that will force SQL Server to use this query plan rather than this one when I run a query. So if I go back to my queries and I find my first query, which is this one, and I rerun it, instead of using the old query plan, it's now forced to use the new query. Instead of using the new query plan, it's now forced to use the old query plan. And of course, we will now get our performance back. Whether this is a good way of tuning or just a good way of masking bad queries, I will leave up to you to consider. But I believe this will become a very, very useful feature for tracking bad queries and query consumption and resources and the like. So the compressed function is new to SQL Server 2016, and this allows us to compress data using standard gzip compression and store it as var binary. And this can help to make your tables a lot smaller if you have a large um, text values that you need to store in there. So I'm going to create a table called compress example. And I'm using my drop table if exists function. And I'm going to insert into that a large block of text. And I'm going to do it 5,000 times just so that we get a decent amount of data in there. Otherwise, it's a bit difficult to see the difference. And now I'm going to create another table called no compressed example. And this time, I'm just going to insert the data as is into a var, jar, var char max column, and I'll do that 5,000 times. And if we now compare sizes between the two tables, we'll see that in the no compress, the data takes up 1,912 kilobytes, and in the compressed example, it takes up 1,384. So we can see that it, compression will save us some space on disk. If we want to get back our compressed value, we can just use the decompress function and cast it as varchar max, and we will get our value back. And there it is. So this is what you will see. Compressed value is all binary, and there is our decompressed value. We can also store variables as compressed values, but it doesn't always save space. If we have a very short variable and a very long variable, I'll create those as variables, then we'll look at the length of the short and the long. You will see that the original one is 17, but the compressed value of I love SQL Server is actually 37, so we're not actually saving space. Whereas for the large block of text, it was 341 bytes, now it's 234, so we are saving some space. If you want to check what is enterprise and standard only, this link will take you to a Microsoft web page that will list all the differences between enterprise and standard. If you want to try some of my examples, I've been using the AdventureWorks 2016 CTP3 database, which also comes with a whole series of example um, queries and scripts that you can use to learn a lot more, and that's what mine are based on. Worldwide Importers is a new example database that has been created by Microsoft for SQL Server 2016. I haven't had a chance to use or look at that to any great deal, but you can download it and it has all the example um, things in it. Another new feature in SQL 2016 is something called Stretch Database. In Stretch Database, Microsoft allow you to split a table 
between your local on-premises server and your Azure server. The idea is you, if you have a, a large table, which is a mixture of current data and archive data, and you're finding that your queries are taking too long because the query has to go through all the old data to find the few rows of current data that you're interested in, then the idea is that if we can move all those archive rows into the cloud, then the table that's kept local is much smaller, so your queries on that small amount of data will be quicker, and SQL Server is clever enough to realize that if your query requires that data, which is now in the cloud, it can pull it back seamlessly. That is the idea. So I'm going to log into my local SQL Server. I've already altered my database to make the remote data archive run. And I can just double check that that is the case. And it comes back and shows the remote data archive value is set to 1, which is what we're interested in. So in AdventureWorks 2012, I'm just going to drop the table if it already exists. I'm going to come down here. I'm just going to create a new table called Stretch Table. And I'm just going to insert 50 rows from the employee table into this. I'm uh, just going to add a unique column just to no for no real reason. Um, I'm now going to add I'm going to add a new column into my stretch table. It's called archive bit, and this column is going to be used to determine whether the the record is old, archive of one, or whether it's still current with an archive of two, where well, archive of zero. So I'm just going to choose some rows and. So I've got 24, which are 0, and 26, which have an archive bit of 1. Now, let's go and find that table, and let's run the stretch wizard. So let's come down here, and let's find that table. So AdventureWorks 2012, Tables, Customers. No, it's stretch table, isn't it? Here we go get confused. So if I right click on stretch table, we will find this new option called stretch. If I click on that, we start the wizard. So first of all, we need to select the table which we've selected, which is the stretch table. We then need to decide what we want to migrate. And many of the examples that you'll see on the internet just migrate the whole table, which Seems a bit pointless because the whole point is you just migrate the bits out of the table. So we can create a function that allows us to determine what will get archived and what isn't. Now my function is fairly straightforward. We're just going to say archive bit equals one. We'll give this a name. So we'll call it archive. If you want a better name. Click check and it will create a table valued function for us. We can't edit this from here. Um, obviously this is quite limited. If you want more complex functions, then you can create them yourself using T-SQL. The thing to watch out for is if your function is so complicated that it takes so long to work out which rows are archived and which aren't, then the performance could be pretty hopeless. Let's click Done. We can now move on to Next. I now need to sign in to Azure. I don't know how many of you have noticed, but Azure has this option that says, keep me signed in. And it never seems to. So it's, I've signed in. I can select which subscription I want to use. I only have one. I'm now going to select the Azure region I want to use. So I'm going to use my North Europe region. 
Interestingly, the UK North and UK South are listed on here. This is the only place that I have seen them. This is June 2016. I'm going to stick with your North Europe. I'm going to use an existing server. And I'm going to use my Clooney web server. I now need to log into that. So let me put my login name in. Let's click next. Now, because I've already run this several times in rehearsal, there is already a master key created for this. So I'm just going to put in my password for my master key. Otherwise, you could you would have an extra step there to create your master key. So naturally, if you wanted to connect this up, you need to open up a firewall rule. You would generally have a firewall rule for your server or your office to be able to collect. connect. I'm just going to use my current IP address. And here we have all the options available that it's going to do. And the one that will jump out at you is this one down here. The estimated pricing is 900 US dollars per month. 784 euros a month when I last looked at the pricing web page. Microsoft advertised this as a solution for cheap storage for holding your data. At 900 euros a month, I would question whether that is cheap storage. My MSDN account, I get 90 euros a month compared to a cost here of 780 euros a month. So this would wipe out my credits very, very quickly. But I'll click Finish anyway. We will let it run through. So it's creating the firewall rules. It's now creating a database for me on my Azure SQL Server. And we'll go and have a look at that in a minute. It's then creating my table value function, configuring the stretched table, and it will automatically start transferring your archive data to the cloud and leaving your current data locally. And every time you update a row in your current data to make it archived, then this will automatically move it for you. Now we'll just leave that running for a minute. So it looks like it's going to take a little while. Some of the drawbacks to Stretch Database, there are numerous restrictions. You cannot have computer columns, defaults, or check constraints. It can't be referenced by a foreign key. So you can stretch your order, deta order detail table, but not your orders table. You can't update or delete any of the archive data once it's got there. And as you have seen, the filter predicate has got limitations. So let's nip back and see how it's going. And we'll just let this run through to the end. And there we are. It's now complete. That took about two or three minutes to run. <clears throat> You'll see that the icon on my local on-premises server has now changed to a cloud to indicate that this has a stretched, a stretched table within it. If I come down here, I can run these commands, <coughs> and these will show me where my data is. Spaced used command, I can look at local only, remote only, and all. If I run these, we will see But currently, all the data is still local. It hasn't archived yet. If we run it again, still hasn't moved. And now you'll see that I have 24 rows locally, 26 rows 
remotely, 50 rows in total. <coughs> so if I run the select statement for archive bit equals one, which are my archived rows, pulling them from the cloud. Took six seconds. If I run my select statement where my archive bit equals zero, so they're just the local rows. Not much better performance in this case. I'm sure if you had several hundred thousand rows, you would probably see the difference. If we come back to our portal, and let's just refresh our list of SQL databases, you'll now see I have a new database, RDA AdventureWorks CTP, <coughs> and you'll see that it has a pricing tier of Stretch and DS100. If we look at the options available to us, we can restore this or delete it if we wish. But, as I said, this is very expensive, so I'm going to sleepily delete it. I don't want to have it sitting around using up all my credit. Let me refresh. It's now gone, thankfully. And then I will also turn off remote data archive as well. So there's no risk of me getting charged extra. Hopefully this has given you a head start into looking at SQL 2016. It may have wet, whetted your appetite to take a deeper look at some of these features that you may be able to use in your company to improve your databases and your work. If you want to contact me, my address is on the screen. As I said before, I occasionally blog on the getanalyst.com website and I hope this has definitely been of use to you and thank you for listening. <laughs>